It's time to address the black sheep in the room, the conclusion of the division, and the worst crash in NASCAR history. This is the end of the NASCAR Sportsman division. By 1995, the NASCAR Sportsman division, though grids were still healthy, was looking dated. Charlotte races were still throwing shows, with large entry lists often topping 50 or 55. However, the idea of letting inexperienced drivers loose on big tracks was no longer as appealing. NASCAR was starting to improve safety measures, which had stagnated somewhat over the past few years. It was no longer always the driver's fault if they were injured. Russell Phillips had seen a couple heavy accidents. The Concord Speedway regular and Mint Hill, North Carolina native had been sportsman for most of its existence. A truck detailer by trade, Phillips had been finding speed over the past couple years and was looking to improve on his best finish of 8th. Going into the Winston 100, heavy rain was expected, and so it was no surprise when Hurricane Opal framed the race, scheduled for the night of October 4th, out. Instead, the surprise was who the pole sitter was. Winning his very first sportsman pole, Russell Phillips. With a time of 157.444 miles an hour, he was the fastest of the 57 entries in Tuesday qualifying. Starting alongside him was Wally Fowler, who had passed inspection for a change. Sportsman cars were not normally inspected beyond a basic lookover after qualifying, but Fowler had been on NASCAR's radar ever since his 1994 disqualification from the Pocono races. The poor weather continued, and several Winston Cup sessions were watched out on October 5th and 6th, as was qualifying for the Durham 100, the seventh sportsman race of the year, to be held October 7th. However, around midday on October 6th, the weather cleared and the announcement was made that the race would go green around 4 p.m. The drivers raided their cars, and World Sports raided their cameras. They had been intending on broadcasting the race live on Wednesday night, but because NASCAR hadn't been sure when the race would go green, that had to be scrapped. Instead, the plan was to film the race and show it on tape delay over the next couple days. Russell's Oldsmobile Cutlass headed the field for two laps before dropping back, being swiftly overtaken by Lester Wozniewski and Gary Layton. Outside front row starter Wally Fowler also fell back pretty quickly. He eventually finished in the bottom half of the field. As for Russell, he soon found himself racing for 10th position or so, with Stephen Howard of Greer, South Carolina. Howard, already an accomplished late model racer at Greenville Pickens, had started a couple of sportsman races up to that point. Apparently, Russell's chassis dated back about 10 to 12 years. However, the body he had on the car was rather new. Russell's brother John worked as a tire changer for James Finch's Bush team which ran part-time as driver Jeff Purvis, and Finch's team, Phoenix Racing, assisted Russell with building the body. A couple of anecdotes have been thrown around as to how Russell was so fast. It is known that he had a new engine in the car and had another that was lined up for the Duron 100, and according to Robin Caldwell and long-standing rumors, Russell's chassis may have been loosened a little bit to improve aero. This, alongside a couple other things, led to a brief meeting between a few drivers on the pit lane before the race started. They were debating whether or not Russell's car was even legal. However, while drivers were suspicious, they ultimately chose not to say anything. The fans had waited long enough for a race after all, they didn't need further drama. And besides, Sportsman was the opening act for Charlotte festivities. Infighting would probably leave bad tastes in the mouths of the fans. Unfortunately, this race would be something the fans would never forget for all the wrong reasons. On lap 17, Joe Guida of Yorktown, Virginia collided with Morris Bice of Hickson, Tennessee. 
The two had started nearby one another and had been battling most of the race. Ronnie Sewell of Shelby, North Carolina, floored it by the wreck. Due to their hard tire compounds, sportsman cars could only swerve or floor it by crashes. Slowing down was impractical. As Howard, slightly ahead of Phillips, approached the scene, Vice's Oldsmobile slid up the track. He checked up into the top lane, encountering Phillips, who had chosen to floor it. Phillips's car hopped Howard's Aerocoupe's wheel, and the two went up into the wall. Both cars were launched onto their sides, Howard on his driver's door and Phillips' passenger door down. Phillips' roof collapsed against the catch fence, dealing him catastrophic injuries to his head and instantly killing him. Both cars flipped back onto their wheels, Phillips' car doing a full inversion, and they slid to a stop in the quad oval. No one else is known to have been collected in the crash. Howard was able to quickly evacuate, and Bice and Gaida refired their cars. A marshal ran over to Russell's car, emptying his fire extinguisher on it as a precaution. After establishing that Russell could not be revived, he motioned to his colleague and checked the time of death on his watch. Exactly what the crash left behind has never been fully established, however it is known that Russell was savagely dismembered in the accident. Most of the trauma is believed to have been caused by a 200 pound caution light, which had pierced through the collapsing windshield. The photographers in the turn 4 stands, which were luckily otherwise mostly empty, have been subject to a terrible sight, as had the spectators at the edge of the quad oval. Several items got stuck in the catch fence itself, including Russell's window nets. Track officials were forced to put up sheets along the catch fencing in order to protect spectators from viewing the cleanup, a task they carried out with surgical gloves. The scene remains most brutal in NASCAR history. The cleanup lasted 33 minutes, and at about 5 p.m., the race resumed. Lester Lesnowski led most of the race, but Gary Layton took the lead with about 10 laps left and scored his first sportsman win. The Duran 100 starting lineup was set by the finishing order of the prior race, with those unable to start being replaced by the fastest DNQs. Layton led the field to the green, but lost the lead early and dropped out from suspension issues a few laps later. Lester Lesnowski dominated the race from there. The crash was shown on evening news across the country that night, stunning the motorsport community. He used Usenet, a predecessor to the internet which had entered relevancy a year or two prior, to share their thoughts. The fans were thoroughly horrified by the accident and heavily criticized the sportsman division. This would be the end of the division as it was. On November 29th, Charlotte Motor Speedway dropped the sportsman division. No official announcement regarding Pocono was made, but the Super Speedway sportsman division was no more. The division was dated, and Phillips' crash was the final straw. The May Charlotte festivities were replaced by an ARCA doubleheader in 1996. The October festivities were scrapped entirely. A few short track races were held in 1996, which are sometimes regarded as sportsman races but most drivers had migrated to what would become the Hooters Pro Cup Series, so NASCAR dropped these races after that year. At first, the Hooters Pro Cup Series used most of the same cars that had been used in the sportsman division. However, within a few years, most Hooters Pro Cup cars were specially built. It was the end of the division where, in front of Winston Cup teams, a cell phone team with a rent transmission and one permanent pick crew member finished second once. The division where a builder with no experience in anything beyond go-karts won a pole. And the division which gave us Ward Burton and Todd Bodine. After the crash, Russell's car was sent up to Connecticut and destroyed in the LaJoy family scrapyard. Nothing remains of the number 57 Hendrix Office Machines Oldsmobile Cutlass, 
which had apparently begun life as a Bobby Allison Bush car. Reportedly, his family held on to the new engine he was going to install for over a decade before selling it. It is unknown if the compromised roll cage, if he did have one, played any factor. The plane broadcast was called off after the accident. I'm not sure what took its place. However, the race was never broadcasted. Joe Gatta moved up to trucks, where he ran as an independent for a few years, and more spice returned to Tennessee's dirt tracks. As of 2019, he can still be found there. While Stephen Howard found success in the NASCAR All Pro Tour, he never got over his involvement according to several drivers, despite the crash not being his doing. Howard stepped away from full-time racing in 2005, and passed away in February 2011 at the age of 36, of course it's never officially released. Though Howard was thoroughly shaken, most of the drivers, though disturbed, saw this as part of the sport. Motorsport sport is a risk, and people will die while taking part. And yet, drivers love to race. For a race, many drivers say a prayer, likely including Russell, who is very religious, that they'll see another race. But, by firing their cars, drivers assume responsibility. Could such an accident happen today? It's doubtful. In 1996, Dale Earnhardt was hooked into the outside wall at Talladega. The car hit the wall with such force that it overturned, and during its roll, it was struck in the windshield. But it nearly head on first hit, as second hit so hard that the car basically collapsed, and Hart survived with broken bones. Due to both this and Russell's accident, the Earnhardt bar was introduced to act as an extra windshield support. It was upgraded after Ryan Newman's crash at Talladega in 2009, so it's likely the combined Earnhardt and Newman bars will prevent such an accident from ever happening again. However, it's always possible. This motorsport is unpredictable, and all the cards were there for such a crash to occur in Winston Cup, and only driver experience and training prevented it in the high ranks. Racing is dangerous, and this division symbolized that, to the point where, according to Sherry Minner, the sportsman drivers had a collective nickname. They were the Wild Bunch. Rest easy, Russell.